Good morning, everyone. First of all, thanks to the Lord for this privilege and this opportunity. Also, thanks to the elders and to the deacons, and thanks to the whole congregation. And by the way, thanks to Brother Kennedy for this last song. It's a beautiful song. It is a, like a summary of my, of my lesson, of my sermon this morning. Thank you so much, Brother Kennedy. So the Bible says well, when Jesus entering Gethsemane, he knew that he would be trapped there, that he would pass a series of trials and humiliation that they took him inexorably to the cross. John 18 verse 4 said that the Lord, he already knew everything. Over and over again, we see all the Gospels consciously to emphasize the omniscience of Jesus. This is one of the attributes of God. And Jesus knew everything. He knew all the things that would come to him. Nothing of what happened that night was accidental. Nothing to him by surprise. And then we're going to see Jesus in the garden, in the next line, in the second line, we're going to see a Jesus praying in agony. At the time when he was praying, he was agonizing in the garden. And he was agonizing at that moment for you and for me and for the whole humanity. He was aware of everything that was happening. Nothing was beyond his control or the control of the Father. Jesus got everything in his hand. When he arrived at the Gethsemane, he was near the mirror of the night. It was the finale of a busy week. Jesus and his friend, the apostle, were very busy that way prepping the feast or the Easter feast that was celebrated in Israel once in a year. It was a, a busy, very busy way. It was the finale of a very busy day. And the disciples showed signs of tiredness. They were extremely tired because they were working very hard the whole day. But Jesus, the Bible said that Jesus had a mother that was more important than his sleep. When Jesus took his friend to the garden, they were so tired, they started sleeping over there. But, but not Jesus. Jesus was something that was more important than his sleep, and that is to pray. We need to pray. The Bible says that we need to pray without ceasing. And when we pray, it's because we are praying, because we are seeking for a deliberation that the Lord is going to provide. But not every time we get the deliberation of our petition, of, of our prayer, remember that the answer is in the hands of the Lord. And the Lord, his answer, sometimes it could be yes, to our prayer, or could be no, or it could be you need to wait. At this time, Jesus got something that was more important than sleep. It was to pray. To pray, what for? Because everything is going to come to him suddenly. So it is waiting for him the next day. The next day 
or the following day was waiting for him, for him the crucifixion, it was waiting for him the mocking, the beating of the pagans or, or the Gentiles. But in the next line, we see that never, never had any experience such sadness of the soul. And we read that in Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 through verse 44. When Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of CBD and began to grieve and distress. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, So, you men could not keep watch with me for an hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went our, our way again a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing one more. The Bible says that the Lord was in extreme agony. And Mark repeated the same word that Matthew said. Mark said that. The Lord was in extreme agony that led him to the point of death. Mark chapter 13, verse 34. But look, in the book of Luke, in the next line, we read something different that only Luke brought it. If we're reading Luke chapter 20. 22 verse verse 42 the bible says says luke chapter 22 verse 42 through 44 saying father if you are willing remove this cup from me yet not my will but yours be done now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him, and being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. Luke is saying something different, and Luke says that his so it was like drops of blood. Luke is not saying that was exactly blood, but was something similar to the blood. This word lie, we, we find the same word in several passages on the Bible. For example, in the book of Revelation, the apostle John wrote that he saw a sea of glass or a sea like crystal in Revelation chapter 15, verse 2, we find the same word like in, in the chapter 6 of Revelation chapter 6, verse 4, we say we say the same word like something similar, but 
this is a real disorder that a human being can suffer. And this disorder is called hematidrosis. We don't know exactly what look what meaning or what he's trying to say with this word right, right here. But the, the point is, I'm not gonna be explaining that point right now, but the point is that he was praying at this time in agony. He was in a very sorrow. He was crying to his father and, and he swells. Luke said that his sweat looks like drops of blood. Something similar to the blood. And the Bible says in the next line that many other people have suffered the crucifixion before Jesus and have not experienced such a state. But Luke is describing for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that his drug was like drops of blood. The crucifixion was a practice of the, of the Roman Empire. It was the, the, the way to execute ex or, or execution for the criminals or the pagans or a bad person. But the Bible said that never ever nobody else has suffered the kind or the state like Jesus was suffering at this time when he was in the garden praying to his father. But the question is in the next line why was he deeply distressed? Why? Could it be for the physical suffering? Could it be for the crucifixion of the next day, for the mocking of the next day? Yeah, maybe, maybe for that, but not exactly for that. There was something else than that. We're reading Matthew in the chapter 10, verse 28. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He said, do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the sword, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And so we, we find the answer right here. Jesus wasn't in a different distress, not for the physical suffering. He talked to his friends, don't fear, don't fear those people. People is gonna persecute you for, for my sake, but don't be afraid of that. They are gonna kill you. They are gonna crucify you, but don't, don't fear about that. Fear to God. God is the only one that is able to kill both body and soul. So the question is, why Jesus was deeply distressed? The answer is, it wasn't for this. It wasn't for the physical uh, uh, death. It wasn't for that. In John chapter 12, verse 27, we'll read it again. In chapter 12, verse 27 of John, now my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I came to this hour, my soul. He's not saying my body, he's saying my soul. We got more than, than a body, we got body and soul and a spirit. And the part that, that Jesus was scared or was fearing was about his soul. And he's saying right here in John, my soul, my soul has become troubled. It has become troubled to the point of death. So 
he was in a different distress not for the physical suffering but he was for the cop he was in a deeply distress for the wrath of god because he wanted to be free from that cup what does that cup mean we read an example right here in the book of isaiah chapter 51 in the verse 17 rouse yourself rouse yourself arise O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the Lord's hand the cup of his anger, the chalice of reeling you have drank to the dress. Jerusalem drank the cup of the anger of Jehovah God. Why? For their disobedience to the Lord, for their rebellion to the Lord. The Lord gave to them to drink the cup of his anger, punishment for the sin of his people. This is why Jesus was in a deep distress, because he knew that he must to drink the cup of the wrath of God. Jesus was in a deep distress. For the sins of many. Hebrew chapter 9, verse 28. We read it over there in the book of Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. The Bible says, So Christ, all, so Christ also having been offered once to bear the sins of many will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him jesus was offered what for to bear the sins of many that was the reason that jesus was at this moment when he was praying in the garden in a different distress because he knew he knew and he understood that to drink the cup it, it was meaning to be bearing the sins of many we read the same thing in first peter chapter 2 verse 24. you read with me and he himself bore or sin in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and lead to righteousness for by his womb who you were cured peter says he bore he bore or sin where peter says in his body Jesus went to the cross and he knew that he was going to the cross the next day and he was in a deep distress he was praying in agony for that because he knew that he was wearing the whole thing of the whole humanity in his body and that's why the wrath of God was against him that means to drink the cup and that he was feeling that because he know he knew the anger of god he know his father better than nobody else he was with, with his father in heaven for eternity he was in a deep distress because christ will carry all the fire of wrath divine against him we we'll read it again in second corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 he made him who knew nothing to be seen on our behalf 
so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The Father made the Son who knew nothing to be seen on our behalf. When the Son was dying on the cross, the Father made him sin. He was bearing the sin of all mankind. That's why the wrath of God upon him. That was that was the reason that Jesus was in a deeply distress. That was agonizing at the time when he was praying in the garden because he knew that. In the next in the next line, we see he was in a deeply distress because Christ will carry the sin. Because Christ will carry all the fire of the wrath divine against sin, Second Corinthians chapter five twenty one. But in the next line, we see because the Father he was in a deeply distress because the Father would hide his faith of Christ the Son. He was in a deeply distress for this because he knew that that his Father was hiding his faith of Christ the Son. In the next line, we see this explains his cry of anguish that we read in Matthew chapter 27, verse 45. His cry was, Father, why have you forsaken me? Father, why are you not with me at this moment? The Bible said that that cry on the cross reflects the intensity of the bitterness of the cup which was given to him. And we see the Lord Jesus Christ that he continued praying in the garden in the line number three, in the phone number three. He was in agony, praying in agony to his father, but he was begging at the time when he when he was agonizing in the in the garden. He was an honest begging. We read that one in Matthew 26, verse 39, verse 42, and verse 44. He was praying and begging to his father if it is possible, if it is possible that pass this cost cup from me three times. He was begging to his father. When we are, like I said before, when we are praying to the father because we are looking for a deliberation of our problems, struggles, or different things. But so not all the time, the answer of the Father is going to be, I'm going to deliver, deliver to you. Sometimes the Father said, no. Oh, you need to wait. But Jesus continued begging to his Father because he feared to face the wrath of his Father. He wanted to avoid it if he if he had been somehow possible. But the question again, why why does he beg in that hour? In the following line, we see that one. Why he was begging in that hour? This was something that was already agreed with the Father since the eternity. He already made a covenant, a covenant with his Father. I'm going to descend to the earth. I'm going to come down to the earth. And I'm going to die for the sin of the war. So why he was begging at this hour? Oh, the answer is simple, because 
the only son of man was approaching to his hour. He was the son of God, or he is the son of God, but he is also the son of man. We see both things in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the son of man and the son of God. And the son of man, he was in the flesh. Let's remember, we, he was in the flesh. That was the reason that he was begging to his father and his hour was approaching. And in the last part of his prayer, we, we see him that he is praying in, in agony, but even in agony, he is in submission. Know what I will, he says in his prayer. It's a prayer of submission. Know what I will, but what you will. Mark chapter 14, verse 36. Let's read the verse. Bible says, and he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Abba, Abba, it's me like we, we say in English, Daddy, or Dad. Daddy, Father. All things are possible for you. Are all things possible for, for the Father? Yes, absolutely. Amen. Everything is possible for his Father. But the answer of the Father, he was saying, yes. It doesn't mean that all things are not possible for the Father. And Jesus recognized that. Father, all things are possible for you. Remove the, this cup from me. But we also see the submission right here in the last part of the verse. Yes, not what I will, but what you will. He see, we see his submission. All natural and human feelings, he submits to the will of his father. It must be the same with us. We must submit all our desires, all our appetites, and all our will to, to God. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, we read that. Chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. We need to present, we need to submit, our body and soul belong to the Lord. We, we hear sometimes people saying, the body is my, belong to me. It's my own body. I can do with my body whatever I want. That's not true. The body belongs to God. He's the creator. The creator of the body and soul. We're going to give account for our body and for our soul. If we are using drugs or drinking alcohol or what killing ourselves or body, we're going to give account for that. And the Bible says, the Apostle Paul says, we need to present our body in a living and holy sacrifice to God. And Romans chapter 6, verse 9, the Apostle Paul repeats almost the same thing. Chapter 6, verse 19. I am speaking in human terms. Because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you present your members as a slave 
to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness. So now present your members as a slave to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. In the same way that we were using our body or our members to sin, the Apostle Paul said now, now use the same members to be holy, to sanctify God. We got energy, we got health. Let's use this energy and this health to serve the Lord. We got a good voice. Let's use this voice to sing. To sing what? To sing Him and the spiritual songs to the Lord. Singing with grace, the Bible says. If we are as strong, let's use our strength to war for the Lord. We have to use our members. We need to submit at the same way that Jesus was in submission at this moment when he was praying in the garden in Gethsemane. In submission, he was praying. In the next line, in submission, he was praying for the cup. The Bible says, for the cup to pass, not at any price. Only, Jesus said, only if there is another way to carry out the plan of God. Or prayers, is, this is a good example of, of submission. We have to be humble when we are praying to the Lord. We need to submit everything to the Lord. And he responds saying yes or saying not. We don't have to be upset. We have to continue praying. And to be humble. God's answer to Jesus is, there is no another way. You must to drink the cup. There is no another way. But glory to God, because now we are saved. We are saved because Jesus decides to bear our sins. The Bible says that this was an agreement or was something already agreed. The next line was something already agreed by them. Who are they? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are ready, they have already agreed this. I repeat, the Son of Man was in sorrow, was in a deep distress, was suffering, was fearing the Son of Man, for he knew that he must to drink the cup of the wrath of God. In Titus chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 2, let's read it. For a bold servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness. Verse 2, in the hope, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who came no life, promised long ages ago. It was an agreement, it was a, a covenant between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're going to descend, and you're going to die on the cross, you're going to drink the cup, and it's going to be eternal life for everybody. And there is a similar text right here it's in Second Timothy, verse 1. So I'm going to read it for you. For an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus. The promise of life 
is in Christ Jesus. So it was an agreement between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're going to descend, and the eternal life is going to be through Jesus Christ, the Son. But you need to descend, and you need to you need to go to die on the cross. And it's going to be eternal life for everybody. In conclusion, <clears throat> in conclusion, we see that the Lord Jesus, he finished a victorious prayer on the garden. He was praying that night for you and for me. And next day, he was going to the cross to open a door for everybody. But the Bible says that now everybody needs to hear the voice of Jesus the Christ to be saved. The Bible says that everybody needs to believe in the Son of God to be saved. The Bible also says that everybody needs to confess as Jesus, as the Son of God, to be saved. The Bible also says that everybody needs to repent to be saved. And the Bible says that everybody needs to be baptized for the forgiveness of the sins to be saved. And the Bible also says that everybody needs to continue to be faithful to the point of death to be saved. Thank you so much, brethren. God bless you. Thanks, thanks for the attention and the lesson just.